Thank you, Rebecca, uh, Jasmine, and everybody. Uh, specifically, thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, I think this is a testament right here when I look around to how serious everybody takes this. So uh, thank you from me and Cal Fire for being here. My name is Jonathan Cox. I'm uh, the San Mateo County Division Chief for Cal Fire, which encompasses San Mateo County. Uh, I'm also the Division Chief for San Mateo County Fire Department, where two hats under one agency. Uh, I've had the unfortunate experience of being assigned to the Camp Fire, the Car Fire, the Wolseley Fire, uh, and the North Bay fires over the last two years. So I've seen more uh, fire in my last two years than the previous uh, 18 to that, uh, and have some experiences that I want to share with you, as well as uh, how we respond to those fires. Uh, so just to, to start off, um, we're just going to watch a quick little video, and then we'll uh, get right into it. Initially, I don't think any of us expected the outcome that came out that day. Uh, I think so we got shelters deployed and multiple vehicles burning all around us. And we all realized that we had some trouble. Multiple vehicles on fire with also almost every structure around us was fully involved. I fully ex expected, giving those orders that John were putting firefighters in jeopardy. People were, were asked us, okay, am I going to die today? And I said, we will, we will not let you die today. And they didn't. So they knew the magnitude of the situation and the severity. And they all went up there into the, into the fire and did a miraculous job. All right, so I think that just kind of sets the tone for talking about response when we talk about these uh, uh, these predictions and what, what the fire outlook looks like in California and uh, kind of where the rubber meets the road when the actual events do happen. Uh, just to start off, uh, kind of to dovetail on what uh, Rebecca was saying, uh, this, this is a snapshot of last year. Uh, 7,500 fires, 1.8 million acres of land burned in 2018. Uh, if you look at the average uh, acres uh, burned in a typical fire season in California, it's about 233,000 acres of land. Uh, so 2018 was worse than 2017, which was worse than 2016. Uh, and maybe most importantly and most tragically is the fact that 22,700 structures were destroyed last year in a single year by wildfire in California. Uh, one of those being on the Camp Fire, uh, the single largest and most destructive natural disaster in uh, the U.S. last year. Uh, so the implications of this uh, are, are serious, uh, they're large, and um, they're, they're present danger. So there's this term out there, has everyone heard that term, the new normal, uh, keeps getting thrown around? I feel like it's been stolen from the fire department and used all over the place now. Um, other people are calling it the abnormal normal um, and, and kind of what we're experiencing right now. And the question always comes up is why? Like Why is this happening? There's so many different theories and stuff going on. Uh, this is just kind of the bulleted list of, of what we're seeing on the fire line out there right now. Uh, Rebecca talked a little bit about temperatures. One of the biggest things we're seeing is our average nighttime temperatures are higher than they've ever been. And nighttime temperatures for firefighters are really important because that's when the fuel moisture comes up in our vegetation and it gives us an opportunity to actually get some containment. When you don't get those, those numbers coming down, uh, your burning the next day gets worse and you're actually your ability to put out fire at night is really difficult. Uh, the last five years have been the five hottest years on record in California, so with that we've had the nighttime temperature issue, which has increased fire behavior. Uh, intense wind events, uh, if everyone thinks back, I know Sonoma remembers that night with the wind. All of the fires that we've had over the last three years have all been driven by wind, and been wind-driven fires. Uh, a lot of red flag conditions, a lot of offshore wind events, if we think Oakland Hills fire was also a wind event. Uh, so as a firefighter, one of the biggest concerns we have is this increase in offshore wind events because that's really what's driving these fires uh, and has a big impact on us. Third is the changing in the vegetation that we see. Uh, well, does anyone know how many trees are dead or dying in California right now? Do you have any questions? Um, so one, last count was 129 million dead or dying trees in California at the moment. Uh, and and uh, over the last three years, which may be a better point of reference on this, we've been able to 
uh, mitigate about a million of those. So we only have 129, million, 129 years left before we'll actually get ahead of this tree problem. Um, but that is indicative of a changing climate and obviously a changing vegetation model, which has impacts on where and how fires burn throughout the state. Uh, one other thing is what we call the RUI, the Wildland Urban Interface, where people actually build homes and where they live. Uh, a really good example of this, and the folks from Sonoma County and the city of Sonoma will know this, uh, the, the fire that burned, the Tubbs fire in Santa Rosa that burned uh, last year, it burned in a footprint that was almost identical to the 1964 Hanley fire. Uh, the only difference was this, or two differences. One, the Hanley fire in 64 took four days to burn from Calistoga to Santa Rosa. The Tubbs fire took four hours. The second part of it is the Hanley fire burned about 80 cabins during that time. It was a predominantly a cabin area. The fire in 2017 burned 5,000 homes in that same area. So I think that's a great stark contrast between 1964 and now. And if you look at the trajectory we're on when we look at these things uh, kind of at a, at a broader level. Uh, fourth or fifth is the legacy infrastructure issue that I know all of us are living with here right now. Uh, specifically, I'm talking about roads and egress and getting out of places. Uh, we're, we can't really change how we've developed, but we uh, can change how we respond uh, to those developments that are out there. But the legacy infrastructure is a real challenge for all of us, uh, especially the non-conforming legacy infrastructure. And then finally is just the length of fire season. Uh, about 78 days longer than it was uh, 10 years ago uh, is the average length of fire season. Uh, our agency is now uh, basically going to a year-round fire season model, uh, kind of transitioning from seasonal staffing to permanent staffing on the wildland side, uh, and recognizing when we're not fighting fire, we better be managing the vegetation that we're protecting during the summer, because they go hand in hand. So it's a, a, big, a big kind of uh, shift. This is just a quick video. Uh, I'll, we'll show, can we hold on, it's gone. Okay, this is the campfire, uh, 8 a.m. 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 11 a.m., noon, 1 p.m., 2 p.m. So I'll go on for four days, don't worry. <laughs> this is 4 p.m., 5 p.m., Six, eight p.m., nine p.m., and we'll go to about ten p.m. So that's ten p.m. That's the campfire. That's what we call progression map. That's the speed at which that fire moved. And the reason I want to show it is because you know it started up in the community of Polga. This is the the city of Chico right here. Uh, it started about 6.37 in the morning, and it made it to Highway 99 by 9 p.m. that night. Um, so I think when we have these discussions today, think about these new abnormal fires in the sense of being extremely fast-moving, wind-driven fires, where fire suppression is not the priority, but rescue is the priority. Because that, that's the fire behavior we're seeing right now with these large fires. So where does this all fit in? Uh, the, the, the classic disaster management model has the kind of the incident occurring, the response, the recovery, the mitigation, uh, and the prevention. Uh, I'm going to speak just a little bit about response uh, and some of the preventative measures. Uh, I do always like to say the unsung heroes in disasters are actually the people that work everywhere but response, right? The big shiny fire engines get a lot of attention, but all the fires that didn't happen because of initiatives and, and projects that happened are actually even more important than those fire engines that go out there and respond to those fires every day. All right. I think I broke the machine, maybe? <laughs> Here I was worried about the video, and it's just the clicker. Okay, ah, perfect. Okay, so if we um, go back one slide, just oh, perfect. Uh, just want to talk really quickly about how firefighters respond to fires. And this sounds super basic, right? You got a nine one one call, firefighters go to the fire. Uh, in, in California, it's a little bit more complex because we have uh, a we're a big state with a lot of different agencies, but b we have state land, we have federal land, we have local government land, and we all respond. Uh, together to kind of collectively uh, deal with it. 
I will say this thing about San Antonio County. This county is a leader when it comes to fire service delivery, hands down, across the state. Uh, this, this county is one of the best. And I, I would be remiss if you didn't recognize some of the chiefs that were in the room. Uh, Chief K. Meyer from Central County Fire, Chief Healy from San Mateo Consolidated Fire. Uh, these are your leaders who basically have established a borderless fire system in San Mateo County. Uh, that if that could be the case across the state would be incredible. But you uh, rest assured the local government response here is, is one of the best. With that, when a fire uh, does occur and a 911 call comes in, uh, uh, the call goes to Dan Belleville's center, the, 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 the Public Safety Communications Center in Redwood City, uh, which is a consolidated fire EMS and uh, a law enforcement center, and you get the fire engine started. It could be from a bunch of different agencies responding to it. If that fire, if that wildland fire occurs in what's called a mutual threat zone, so an area that's established that says, if a fire starts here, it's going to threaten my land really quickly, and it's going to threaten my land really quickly, then you automatically get a CAL FIRE response as well. Or if it's in the unincorporated areas, you get a CAL FIRE response as well. So a lot of times in the summer, you're getting dual responses, local government response and CAL FIRE. Uh, and with that, you get uh, aircraft, you get dozers, you get a whole bunch of different things that actually come in. Um, and, and you can always order more, essentially. I'm gonna hit these really quick. Uh, the incident command is always between the local government agency uh, and the state and whoever is there representing their land. So. When these incidents occur, it's always uh, unified for a common uh, goal and a bunch of objectives. We always bring in law enforcement for the evacuation portion of it uh, and, and any other agencies that may be there. And we all work together as a single ordering point to get the resources we need, the aircraft, the dozers, the engines, uh, to actually deal with the disasters. All right, one thing, just a couple people I'd like to recognize really quick. If Rich Sampson, Denise, Enya, Joe, uh, if you could stand up, and Chloe. I uh, just want to call out these four individuals. These are some of your leaders of the Fire Safe Council here in San Mateo County. Uh, Fire Safe is one of those organizations that if you don't know about, uh, does a lot of great preventative vegetation management work. Uh, and they are the first Fire Safe Council in California. Uh, in 1987, they were established. Another example of uh, this county being a leader in vegetation management. Uh, for those of you who are interested, Cal Fire does offer grants every year to local government organizations for vegetation management. You can learn more about that on our websites. Uh, a little bit about evacuation, and we'll talk about this more in the breakouts later, uh, but evacuations are a really big kind of area of focus right now. Uh, and what we're really focusing on is how do you plan better to get people out of an oncoming fire. Uh, so right now, a lot of the, uh, the focus is on using data and statistics to really outline hey, we can have a much more scientific approach to getting people outside of the area uh, if we work together and we actually identify some of the areas and, and characteristics that can be used uh, to get people out. And then finally, how do we communicate all of this to the public? Uh, one thing is, you know, it, it is, it, it's not just on the fire department. There are so many different people and organizations that fire touches. Uh, and you look at the campfire, or the Tubbs fire, for example, Fire does not know geographical boundaries. Uh, and that's why you know, I smile when I see all these different jurisdictions in here because what we have to do to match that challenge is, is basically not uh, work in silos on fire prevention. So some of the kind of cross the board initiatives are the uh, Ready, Set, Go initiative for our, for our community to basically give them a single point of learning about fire prevention and mitigation measures they can take on their own lands. Uh, two, informing people about the importance of adhering to red flag warnings, because that's one of those common denominators that we're seeing across the state. Uh, and then uh, three, finally, alerting citizens of a fire when it occurs. Uh, going back to that evacuation piece, how do we prepare better? And a lot of the discussion today I look forward to hearing is ideas for how to prepare better for evacuation. So that's what we're doing on the uh, preparedness and communication side uh, uh, with the members of public uh, across the county. Just want to close with this slide right here. This is the campfire uh, from a satellite view at about 1045 um, in, in uh, Chico. You can see the, what it looks like. And the reason I bring this slide up to think about to close it all out is one of the big things that comes out of these fires is the people who die and the people who are injured are our most vulnerable populations. And I keep saying this over and over again. 
our elderly, our mentally handicapped, our physically handicapped, and those who can't act for themselves. So as we think about strategies and preparedness today, uh, just keep that in mind. Keep this photo in mind and understand those people who are unable to get out were really our, our most vulnerable. Thank you.